Gambling. It was a GoFundMe scam that made national headlines. Reckless spending. Nisha Taylor, she will spend 18 years on probation. Faking cancer. Today we'll tell multiple stories about people that scammed the world on the website GoFundMe with varying degrees of shamelessness. And it just goes to show that a tragic tale might not be as genuine as presented on the World Wide Web. GoFundMe is famous for its promotion of medical fundraising. The site allows strangers to assist in paying for otherwise unaffordable health-related bills. Because of this, it's no surprise many scammers take advantage of that generosity. But the most shameless of the lot are those willing to fake terminal illness, especially with their own children. That takes us to CJ Strong, which was started on July 30th, 2017. It was supposedly made by a friend of the LaFrance family, who had just received devastating news. Martin and Jolene were told that their son had Hodgkin's lymphoma, a form of cancer that targets the immune system. They were then informed he had several malignant tumors. The fundraiser reads, CJ has to go to the children's hospital several times a week for treatment, which has forced both Jolene and Marty to take a leave of absence from work. They have been out of work since March, leaving them with no income. Any funds raised will go towards medical expenses, gas for travel, and anything else related to this difficult time. To make matters worse, later updates claimed Jolene herself was afflicted with lupus. The only archive available shows that in the first month, they raised over $3,000. While this wasn't enough to reach their goal, it did catch the attention of locals. CJ and his family were brought to a practice meet by the Syracuse football team. The boy got to meet his favorite college athletes, who even let him break down a chant. The couple told reporters their son actively underwent radiation and chemotherapy. They even said he had multiple lymph nodes surgically removed. That was in spite of the fact that he had a full head of hair. While none of the players or journalists questioned his illness, authorities were unconvinced. Police began a four-month-long investigation that ultimately confirmed their suspicions. CJ was never diagnosed with cancer or any of the conditions his parents solicited donations for. Because of this, on May 7, 2018, Martin and Jolene were arrested. They were charged with first-degree scheme to fraud, as well as child endangerment. The two were ultimately sentenced to five years of probation and $3,000 restitution. GoFundMe subsequently issued a refund to anyone who donated. Alas, the LaFrance family were far from the only people who attempted this kind of stunt, with a similar case occurring just a year prior. In June of 2016, Victoria Morrison started the campaign at Blake's Bucket List. She wrote that her 10-year-old son had recently been diagnosed with leukemia. It then explained her inability to fulfill his last will. He made a list of things he wants to do before he gets too sick, and it's my job to help him do just that. But I'm a single mom to three other kids and work, so please, if you have a spare dollar, help make my son's dream come true. It raised approximately $2,000 as people reached out to make his last days worthwhile. That included a shopping spree with emergency responders and even a helicopter ride. Unfortunately, tragedy struck shortly after these gifts. In early 2017, Victoria revealed on social media that Blake had passed away. Her son's body was to be cremated, with a memorial service held that April. The community was devastated, but weeks later, everything they thought they knew about him was changed. On April 14th, law enforcement discovered that Blake was alive and well, and being hidden away at a motel. Not only that, but he was in perfect health, showing no sign of the supposed ailments. They subsequently arrested Victoria on charges of fraud, and spoke with her son. Through this, they realized Blake had also been led to believe he was dying. She was charged with child neglect or endangerment causing substantial mental harm. As a result, Victoria pleaded guilty and in 2018 was sentenced to a minimum of five years in prison. The money was also thankfully refunded by the site. While both of these examples are of parents exploiting their kids, that trend was far from universal. There are countless examples of an individual faking their own illness for profit, such as the case with the story of Cynthia Smith. 
It all began in the fall of 2014 with the page, Please help us save Cindy's life. It was made by a woman distraught over her friend's health. She wrote that Cynthia suffered from CIDP, an extremely rare autoimmune disorder that causes the body to attack itself. Not only is CIDP incurable, but it often leads to blindness, paralysis, and even organ failure. If that wasn't bad enough, it necessitated frequent hospital visits and medical expenses. That included $7,000 a week for medication, and an experimental surgery that cost half a million. Now, Cindy could no longer afford to survive. Miraculously, the fundraiser proved successful. It was shared across the World Wide Web in the coming months, collecting over $126,000. This attention led the Hamilton Spectator to become interested in profiling the story. In March of 2015, they spoke to the woman's friends and loved ones about her battle. They recalled her health had begun to rapidly deteriorate in October. She was left bedridden, blind, and unable to speak. Eventually, her immune system became so weak she could no longer have visitors. She apparently had to be airlifted to a hospital after experiencing organ failure. The outlet initially took this at face value, but they found themselves unable to substantiate any of Cindy's afflictions. Her close ones also couldn't produce any detailed medical information. Because of this, the article was never published. The same wasn't true for the Burlington Post, who similarly wrote about her case. They only came to the same conclusion afterward, issuing a retraction. But unlike the former, they had contacted law enforcement over their concern. In response, authorities began investigating the woman's past. They seized Cindy's medical documents, finding she had never been diagnosed with CIDP. She was perfectly fine and able to see, walk, and talk. With this, they started to question if others were aware of the lie. But even after scrutiny, they concluded that Cindy had acted on her own. She'd convinced her entire community, including her own family and friends, that she was dying. That included purchasing expensive medical equipment to perpetuate the facade, and her exploitation of their generosity extended beyond GoFundMe. In December, Cindy's mother took her store to shore at the mall to ask for donations. Catherine Rudda, a store manager, saw her sobbing as Cindy sat in a wheelchair. This led her to donate eight boxes of items that once belonged to her own and now deceased mother. Catherine wasn't alone either. Police would find a storage locker filled with similar gifts from locals. What they couldn't recover was the hundreds of thousands of online donations. The vast majority had disappeared, with officials only able to recover $7,200 from her account. In May of 2015, Cindy was arrested and charged with defrauding the public of more than $5,000. The news shocked everyone in her life, still under the belief she was chronically ill. She pled guilty to a lesser charge the next year, and was sentenced to two years of probation. This was, in part, due to their inability to locate the missing funds. They concluded the campaign amount had likely been inflated, but it remains uncertain to this day. Unfortunately, this is only the start of the depths of depravity on GoFundMe. Our next story today starts with a GoFundMe page titled Paying It Forward. It was created on November 10th, 2017 by Kate McClure and her boyfriend, Mark D'Amico. The couple explained that a month earlier, Kate was driving to Philadelphia when she ran out of gas. This forced her to pull over on the side of the highway. It was then that the woman was approached by a homeless man offering to help. Taken aback, she got into her car and locked the doors. But the stranger kept his word. He went to a nearby gas station and used his last $20 to fill up a canister. He then brought it back and filled up her tank. While grateful, Kate had no money on hand, so she promised to return with a gift. The woman and her boyfriend would end up returning several times in the following weeks. They'd bring him cash, snacks, and Wawa gift cards. Each time, they'd learn a little more about the man's backstory. As it turns out, Johnny Bobbitt Jr. was a 34-year-old veteran who served in the Marine Corps. Following his service, he moved around the country going from job to job. That was what brought him to Philadelphia. 
pursuing an offer with just enough money to buy a truck. But the prospect fell through, forcing him to withdraw the little savings he had. It was in the midst of this that he then lost his paperwork. It rendered him unable to work as he quickly depleted his entire bank account. By the time he met Kate, he'd been homeless for an entire year sleeping under a bridge. It was humbling to understand this gratitude came from someone with so little to give. Eventually, they came to the conclusion that he deserved much more. The GoFundMe and its story was so inspiring that they raised over $1,700 in the first week. Bobbitt was ecstatic, as even that amount would change his life. But neither he nor the couple could have predicted what would happen next. The fundraiser went viral as tens of thousands began sharing the link. By November 24th, they'd collected over $400,000, far exceeding the original goal. Because of this, Johnny requested they stop taking donations. The two obliged and wrote in a post. Johnny asked, instead of donating to his campaign, to maybe take a second to search for another worthy cause. That, for whatever reason, hasn't gotten the attention his has. Mark and I couldn't begin to express how grateful we are that you guys made this little fantasy a reality. In the coming days, the three appeared on various TV stations and outlets looking for a feel-good story. Johnny would talk about how fortunate he was to get a second chance at life. Shortly after, the organizers outlined their plan for the fund. The first purchase would be a new home that Johnny fully owned. Then, his dream truck, a 1999 Ford Ranger. The rest was to be put in two trusts set up in his name. The first gave him the ability to collect a small salary each year. The second was for retirement at the behest of a professional. Johnny would be given access only when he felt comfortable. This was so he could one day live out his dream of owning a piece of land in the country. Until then, he was given a bank account with funds for everyday needs. The couple noted the plan was made by the Bobbitt's lawyer and financial advisor. They also vowed to take an active role in helping him secure a job. It appeared that a lot of planning was done to ensure this was all handled correctly. Thus, people trusted Johnny was quietly getting back on his feet as updates slowed down. But unfortunately, this is where the story takes a turn for the worse. You see, behind the scenes, tensions rose as Mark and Kate didn't fulfill their promises. Instead of a house, Johnny was moved into a camper on land owned by McClure's family. He was then given a used SUV that swiftly broke down. The two trusts were similarly never made. Meanwhile, the couple's lifestyle became suspiciously luxurious. Kate purchased a new BMW and started vacationing across the country. She even embarked on a helicopter ride over the Grand Canyon. D'Amico, meanwhile, spent his time gambling at a concerning frequency. These observations made Johnny suspicious over how the funds were handled, and the subsequent confrontation only led their friendship to deteriorate further. To make things worse, Bobbitt then relapsed on heroin. He was put into rehab twice, before being kicked back out to the street. In the end, the man was once again homeless and panhandling. This information came to light in August of 2018, when Johnny was found and interviewed by the Philadelphia Inquirer. There, he also revealed he only met his financial advisor once, and never saw his lawyer. Though this all seemed damning, the couple refuted his claims. They argued the purchases in question were made using their own money. Mark and Kate received sizable sums after appearing on shows like Ellen DeGeneres. D'Amico did admit that he used $500 from the GoFundMe for gambling, but he stipulated that it was all immediately repaid with his winnings. Finally, the two explained their justification for withholding the funds. $200,000 had supposedly already been given to Bobbitt, only for him to waste it. That included a gift of twenty-five dollars on Christmas, which he burned through in a matter of weeks and those spending habits only worsened following the relapse. They noted he started visiting areas known for dealing, and allegedly he even stole and pawned their belongings to fuel his habit. Mark went so far as to state, giving him all that money, it's never going to happen. I'll burn it in front of him. Giving the money to someone addicted to drugs would be like giving him a loaded gun. The remaining half was said to be kept in a savings account. It would only start dispensing when Johnny was sober and had a job. 
Given the man had indeed relapsed, their story seemed plausible, but Johnny denied the alleged theft and felt there was no way he was given anywhere near that amount. The author was able to point out at least one discrepancy. Mark and Kate claimed to have bought two vehicles for Bobbitt in their own name so he could sell them, but by the time the article was written, they'd both been sold anyway. Regardless of who they believed, this all caused a massive wave of backlash. For the public to raise almost half a million for someone who less than a year later was homeless again felt implausible. Enough so that the crowdfunding site itself began investigating. Following these revelations, GoFundMe issued a statement. We are looking into the claims of misuse regarding this campaign. When there is a dispute, we work with all parties involved to ensure funds go to the right place. We will work to ensure that Johnny receives the help he deserves and that the donor's intentions are honored. GoFundMe always cooperates with law enforcement investigations. Afterward, Johnny's lawyer stepped forward to speak for his client's interests. He decided to represent Mr. Bobbitt completely pro bono. His attorney estimated Johnny received only a fraction of the donations, estimating around 75 grand. The rest was transferred to the couple's personal bank and was completely unaccounted for. Because of this, she arranged a meeting with them in hopes of getting a breakdown of how they spent the cheddar. But when the time came, she discovered that no documentation existed. In fact, it was unclear how much was even left. Given how specific the original plan had been, this was a major red flag. Within 24 hours, a lawsuit was filed alleging the duo had committed conspiracy and fraud. The first hearing was held two days later, to which they didn't appear. The judge ordered them to transfer the remaining funds into an escrow account, but by the second hearing, this still hadn't occurred. The judge became frustrated. He once again asked their lawyer about the money. This time, the attorney stated his clients invoked their Fifth Amendment right to avoid self-incrimination and would not produce the financial information requested. It was clear that something was seriously wrong, and that was affirmed when police raided the couple's home the following morning. It was captured on video and posted onto social media. Mark is visibly unfazed, continuing to play golf as authorities search their residence. His nonchalance felt bizarre given criminal charges were now on the table. That was an opinion held by their own attorney, who then dropped the two as clients. He disclosed that none of the money remained. By this point, the case had captured national attention. The once viral stars fell from grace as people scrutinized their past. In particular, they looked closer at Mark, who was embroiled in other concurrent legal issues. The serial gambler was sent to appear in court that month for a completely unrelated crime. He allegedly ripped three headrests off his car and threw them out the window. This hit the vehicle next to him, causing upwards of $2,000 in damages. That was just one of three different traffic incidents. While the others were less severe, Mark refused to address any of them in court. In response, a warrant was issued that led to his arrest on September 10th. He'd quickly posted bail before promising to save his public reputation. The degenerate gambler claimed to have an explanation that would make everything crystal clear. Whatever it was, it didn't impress law enforcement though. Two months later, Mark and Kate were arrested on charges of conspiracy and theft by deception. The public rejoiced, as it seemed Johnny would finally get the justice he deserved. But shockingly, police arrested the homeless man as well later that afternoon. The complaint alleged the trio actually conspired together to fabricate the campaign. This was confusing as the scrutiny only came after the man claimed to have been scammed. Many thought they'd misread the situation, but authorities would clear everything up at a press conference held the next day. Upon raiding the couple's home, they uncovered a trove of electronic records, including bank statements and over 6,000 text messages. This allowed them to uncover a complete timeline of events that contradicted their own beliefs. To start, the backstory had been completely fabricated. The tale where a homeless man helped the woman with his last $20 never happened. In reality, they first spotted him by an underpass during their frequent visits to the casino. 
It started with small gestures of generosity, offering change or a hot cup of coffee, but they eventually fixated on the idea of changing his life. The couple began texting back and forth about potential acts of charity food, clothes, a Nintendo Switch, even a job in a house. But it didn't seem feasible. That is, until they came up with the GoFundMe. While they felt he was deserving of such help, they weren't sure his story alone would catch people's attention. Kate would confess to a friend, the gas part is completely made up, but the guy isn't. I had to make something up to make people feel bad. So shush about the made up part. To achieve this, Mark invented the story of that fateful night on the highway, though it's more accurate to say he repurposed it. He told a nearly identical tale in 2012, while it's living in North Carolina. He recalled on Twitter, So this girl runs out of gas and has a flat tire at the same time in front of a Walmart and is blocking traffic. So I run to the gas station and then change her tire. I spent the only cash I had for supper, but at least she can get her little children home safe. The story worked, and the trio became a sensation overnight. In addition to their media run, the couple were in talks for a book deal. They were set to receive their own share of compensation. But rather than accept that amount, they decided to hoard the GoFundMe as well. It was used to buy designer clothes, cars, and vacations. Records show they withdrew over $85,000 in or around casinos across the East Coast. This discrepancy wasn't lost on Bobbitt, who began demanding more. Johnny was aware of the faux story, but did genuinely need the money. The details of his homelessness, military service, and inability to work was true. But they refused, even after being warned by friends of what could and did eventually happen. In March of 2018, a friend warned Kate, You really need to get Bobbitt and get the public off your back by donating. He could out you. In reply, she remarked, I'll be keeping the rest of the money. F you very much. One message also showed her mother expressing concern. She just called me and said that people go to jail for scamming others out of money. So there's that. That's what my own mother thinks of me. By the time Kate regretted this, it was too late. In one conversation, she admonished, I can't believe we have less than 10k left. I'm so upset. Mark assured her that their book deal would dwarf whatever money they stole. That continued even after the news broke of their betrayal. He suggested throwing Johnny under the bus, entitling it No Good Deed. But as the scam continued to fall apart, the couple started to argue over culpability. Mark wrote, $20,000, BMW, $5,000, Disney World, and land trips, $10,000 in bags. We both went to Vegas, right? Like you act like you didn't spend a dollar. Kate reflected, I wish that you never updated the GoFundMe. Like, we should have just let it go and not effing kept people informed. While prosecutors were still accounting their finances, they were certain that none remained. In light of this, GoFundMe issued refunds to all 14,000 people who donated to Bobbitt. They also revoked their previous offer to fully reimburse Johnny the 400 grand. By this point, Mark and Kate's relationship had deteriorated. The two now had separate lawyers and were dead set on incriminating each other. On November 16th, Kate's attorney claims she'd been victimized by the two men. Kate's a bit naive, and she's come out of a troubled relationship. And now she was with D'Amico, who was 10 or 11 years her senior, and she was under his influence. All of this occurred because of her trust in D'Amico. He argued that while Kate was aware of the initial lie, she was well-intentioned and tried to end the ruse early. When the GoFundMe reached $10,000, she attempted to pause donations, only for the site to state it wasn't possible. She then tried again when it hit 100 grand to no avail. This narrative, however, was easily disproved. GoFundMe allows users to stop campaigns at any time. This is apparent given they'd briefly done so when Johnny asked. But critically, as it turns out, it was actually reopened afterward against his wishes. In light of all this indisputable evidence, the verdict was inevitable. By 2022, Mark and Kate had both pleaded guilty to state and federal charges. Mark was sentenced to five years behind state bars for the misapplication of entrusted property that was concurrent with his federal sentence, which forced him to spend two years at a federal prison. 
Kate was similarly sentenced to a year in federal prison, and an additional two years in state. Johnny was a bit more fortunate. He was sentenced to five years on probation, and mandated to attend a drug rehab program. He was also ordered to pay $25,000 in restitution. It turns out the couple's story of him wasting that amount had legitimacy. Regardless, he was given leniency for both cooperating and being more sympathetic. Our final tale begins with an arrest in Scottsdale, Arizona on March 21st, 2014. That day, local police were called after a woman heard crying in a parking lot. This led her to discover an infant and a toddler, who'd been left directly under the sun in a car. Its engine was off, and the four windows opened slightly. That led the vehicle to reach a temperature of over 100 degrees. The officers waited outside for over half an hour when their mother finally arrived. Immediately, 35-year-old Shanisha Taylor attempted to explain herself. The single parent was homeless and naturally couldn't afford a caretaker, but she had to leave in order to complete a job interview. In spite of this, Shanisa was arrested and booked in jail for felony child abuse. Child Protective Services then took custody of her kids. While she failed to convince authorities, the public felt sympathetic. They questioned what options she truly had in that position. One such individual was Amanda Bishop. She reflected, Shanisha was in an unfortunate situation that sadly an economy like ours is putting many single mothers in a position to make terrible mistakes like this. This led her to the GoFundMe own site, You Caring. On March 23rd, Amanda started a fundraiser to assist in the woman's legal expenses. It quickly gained traction as thousands pledged support. While originally for bail, the funds were later arranged to be deposited to Taylor directly. This was due to the sheer influx of donations. By April 2nd, the page had amassed over $75,000. The description was then updated to confirm the recipient was aware of its existence. I was able to speak with Shanisha for the first time today. She will be receiving the first installment of the fundraiser this week. She is overwhelmed by the generosity of so many strangers. I hope that you will see fit to continue donating to this fundraiser. And as awareness grew, the conversation began to reach beyond the campaign. Her story received national coverage as hashtag I support Shanisha trended on Twitter. There, users pointed out her arrest may have been racist. A petition requesting the charges be dismissed also drew over 58,000 signatures. By the end, the public raised $114,000 for the struggling parent. This was not only heartfelt, but led to opportunities no one could have foreseen. That summer, the prosecution offered a plea deal that gave her a chance to dismiss the felonies. It would also guarantee custody over her three children. She simply had to complete 25 hours of parenting classes and establish trust funds for her kids. It was to be done with $60,000 from the donations. This deal was nothing short of a miracle. Her own lawyer called it proof that justice could be merciful. Not only would the mother no longer be charged with child abuse, but it ensured the money was put to good use. So Shanisha agreed and stated, I realize I made a mistake, but I'm grateful that they took a look at my situation and what I was intending to do that day. With such an outcome, one might expect this to be the end. Shanisha could quietly get back on her feet and work towards the future. But as you can probably guess, that didn't happen. Months later, Shanisha made headlines again when her miraculous plea deal was revoked. It had been conditional on her fulfillment of the agreement. Yet, by the final deadline on November 6th, she still hadn't made either of the trust funds. This infuriated the district attorney. He stated his patience had reached its limits and that she'd be going to trial. It turns out he attempted to compromise with a single parent several times to no avail. That included lowering the amount to $40,000, less than half of the total donations. But continuously, she refused to follow through. Both of her lawyers soon requested to be removed. One remarked their client had thrown away the deal of a lifetime, but the woman defended her inaction. 
Shanisha argued the trust fund was unreasonable, as her kids only got access if they attended college. It was more important to her to pay for current expenses. She claimed to have only spent $44,000, which was used for rent and childcare. But a local activist contradicted this and explained what he saw as a former supporter. Reverend Jarrett Maupin had reached out in order to help her find employment. He arranged job offers in the hospitality industry, which she expressed interest in, but they never went through. He reflected, I call these tailor-ready jobs. All she had to do was show up. Unfortunately, she didn't. But even more damning was information he received afterward. While in his office, he received a phone call from someone who saw her at a music studio. They claim she spent $6,000 to, quote, help finish her baby daddy's rap album. Now Maupin believed her money had run out. When it wasn't spent to pay rent, a new car, or the children's trust, yet you're applying for a public defender because you're broke, all signs point to the money being gone. In response, Shanisha accused the activist of slander and that they hadn't spoken since July 21st. But it was hard to take her word after prosecutors filed records of her spending habits. It was revealed that she was spending over $4,000 a month on non-essentials. That included $300 on clothing, $745 on car-related expenses, and $300 on recreation. Her claim of retaining most of the original amount was also disproven. She initially said the money was in her mother's account, but that fell apart under scrutiny. In reality, only 35 grand was left in her possession. Whatever sympathy the public had for her at this point had evaporated. She was back in court, facing up to 18 months in jail and losing custody. That didn't stop her from attempting to court more donations on social media, all while still not having a job. Her last stunt would be an appearance on Dr. Phil, where she debated Maupin live on stage. Then, the TV host asked donors in the audience if anything they'd heard changed their mind. What you talking about, Shanisha? You were given money. Anybody in this audience would have took and did what they needed to do to avoid legal trouble. And it sounds to me like we're getting a lot of excuses instead of just taking responsibility and saying, hey, you know what? I'm imperfect. I screwed up. That I can take. The trial concluded on May of 2015, when the mother once again took a plea deal. Shanisha pleaded guilty to child abuse and was sentenced to 18 years of supervised probation. This was to guarantee her children were adults when it concluded. While she escaped jail time, it was still vastly inferior to the original offer. If getting a job was difficult before, the mother now had a convicted felony. In that final court appearance, she was quiet and avoided the cameras. The public never heard from her again, as she presumably took the chance to start again more seriously. So there you have a myriad of scams from the website GoFundMe, and it just makes you wonder just what percentage of these donations are mismanaged. And with that, I think I'll end the video here. So until next time, thanks for watching.